Joshua chapter 7 this morning. We've been following the life of Joshua um, all the way back to him being in the valley while Moses was up on the mount, serving as a servant to Moses, his faithfulness to God, his separation from the sinfulness, sinful actions of the people, to being uh, called as the leader to succeed Moses and to see many victories. We just ended last week on the wall around Jericho and its falling. Now we come to a defeat, something really unknown uh, for God's people at this time. Hold on a minute. That's what I'm calling it. You know, if you think about it, you can learn a lot about a person by their victories. How do they handle the winds of life? But I think you can maybe be able to learn more about a person, not in how they handle the winds of life, but how do they handle the defeats of life? How do they handle losing? How do they handle loss? Is it in humility? Is it a teachable moment? Is it, what, what, what do we learn about ourselves in the moments of loss? Or, and I want you to see Joshua does something I think is a great model for us. In chapter 6, as God's people are getting ready to go in and uh, go through the wall, the rubbled walls of Jericho as they fall, and they're going to go in and, 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 and destroy the inhabitants of Jericho, minus Rahab, the prostitute, they're going to, they're warned by God in chapter 6, verse 17 through 19, that they are not allowed to take any of the Babylonian goods. That if they find any of the treasures, that those treasures are to be devoted to the Lord. They're the Lord's. They're to go into the treasury of the Lord. They're not yours, he says. They're God's. And now you fast forward out of Jericho. So God has already stopped the River Jordan from flowing. He has kicked in the front door of the promised land. He has knocked down the walls of Jericho, defeated Jericho and its king. And now there's this little city of Ai. And Joshua sends some spies into Ai. He wants to see what the best plan of attack is against this city. And the spies come back and they tell Joshua, it's a little city. We shouldn't even bother sending a big army. We should just keep it small. Let's just send a small army in there. So that's what Joshua does. He takes the advice of, of those spies, and he sends in this small army. And instead of everything they had seen before, the enemies running and being defeated, instead of that, he sees Israel is now running and being defeated. Israel is retreating. And in that battle, 36 men die. 36 men of God's people die. And I want you to see how Joshua handles the news of this loss, how he handles this defeat. In verse 6, chapter 7, verse 6, then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their head. And Joshua said, alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? Here's a lesson Joshua comes to this place where he knows God is giving them the land. He knows that his job is to help them uh, take that land and, and settle that land. So he knows what God's will is, and he's anticipating in this battle of Ai, at Ai that all that they are going to totally win and overcome the enemy. But when they go back, when Israel is retreating and defeated and 36 bodies are laying on the, the battlefield, he doesn't understand. What he believes to be God's will is incongruent with what he sees. God, you promised to give us this land. You promised to drive out our enemies. I don't understand why Israel is now turning and running. I don't understand this defeat. So what does he do? He humbles himself. He falls on his face before the Lord, covers himself with dust, ashes, that is a sign of humility. He tears his clothes. This is a sign of being totally broken before God. 
He does this all before the Ark of the Covenant. He is drawing as close as he possibly can to God, and he's not afraid to ask God the hard questions. God, I don't understand. God, why is this happening? He believed that God was big enough to answer his questions, so he humbles himself, he falls down, he seeks the presence of God, he is asking God those questions. These are all lessons that we need to be able to do as well. We ought to be able to practice this in our own life. When, when things seem to be incongruent in God's will, seek God, humble ourselves, position ourselves in such a way so that we could hear from God. We're listening for the answer. We're not just talking. We want to hear the answer to our question. And here's what God says. Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? That's not the answer I would have expected, right? Get up, Joshua. God gives him the answer. Israel has sinned. They've transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They've taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Wow. Why'd you, why did this happen, God? What's going on? God said, here's the problem. My people have sinned. There's sin in the camp. Remember I told you last week, that, or two weeks ago, that when they had crossed the River Jordan... The Bible tells us that all the enemies of God's people, their hearts were melting. They were terrified. I mean, they saw what God was doing through the people. They knew where they were going, and they understood they're next on the list. So they're terrified. The inhabitants of Jericho are petrified of the Israelites. And when they cross the River Jordan, that seems like that would have been the best time militarily to strike while the iron's hot. I mean, your enemies are already afraid. You might as well just jump, skip across the River Jordan and just run into the promised land and expel everybody. I mean, do the work. And yet, instead of God telling them to go into the promised land and start destroying their enemies, what God says is absolutely the opposite. God says, I'm not wanting you to go in and fight. What God says is, I want you to stop right where you are. I want all of the males to be circumcised as a sign of the covenant, and I want you to celebrate the Passover. God, are you sure? Shouldn't we be going in and and destroying our enemies? God was teaching them the lesson. This is what I told you. God was teaching them the lesson that it's not about a property as much as it's about a people. God was raising up, teaching, training a people that could trust Him and loved Him. It was much more than giving them property. God was developing a people. So what happens here? Israel has sinned. God is willing to allow them to be defeated. Why? Because His job is not just to give them property. His job is to develop a people. Number one, the sin. God says, Joshua, I'm going to lead you to the one who sinned. We're going to start with the tribe. I'll show you which tribe. And then from the tribe, I'll show you the the familial line. And then from the familial line, I'll take you down to the dad. And then from the dad, I'll take you down to the son. I will GPS the very one who did it? And that's exactly what happened. In verse 15, it says he transgressed this guy and he did an outrageous thing. God's finger continues to follow from tribe to familial line to his parent to son, and it ends pointed at a man named Achan. Achan is now confronted by Joshua. Look with me in verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to God, the Lord of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, 
Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they're hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. That's important, with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua to tell all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua, with all of Israel, took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters, and his oxen, and his donkeys, and his sheep, and his tent, and his PlayStation, and his Xbox, and all that he had. <laughs> and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day, Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Trouble. Let's look at the sin. He describes the sin himself. Once he's confronted with the sin and he realizes he is the man, God has led them right to him. There he is standing exposed. Joshua says, Achan, tell me everything you did. And you know what? Achan does. He takes him back to that moment when the walls fell and he's climbing over the rubble. And as he's going through Jericho to overcome the enemies, he sees some gold, silver, and a beautiful cloak. And he grabs a hold of it, probably much like the other men had done. But instead of taking it to the treasury of the Lord, he takes it back to his tent. He digs a hole and he buries it. And he tells him why he did it. He says he coveted. He wanted something that was not his. Now, I know this morning we, we can probably fill in with the word sin that I'm talking about. We can probably fill in a particular sin in our life. We may fill in the sin of lust or greed or envy or pride or deceitfulness. In our own minds, we may fill that in and give that name, that, that, that sin, an actual name, which we should. And for Achan, that sin was coveting. It eventually led to lying, God said. And then it led to hiding the sin. I want you to think about something for a moment. This was not just a moment. This was not just a sin that was a momentary slip. This was not just something where the equivalent of him saying something he shouldn't have in the heat of the moment. This is not the result of an impulsive moment of sin. No doubt, the original temptation would have been impulsive. It would have happened quickly. He saw it, he had a moment, he grabs it, and he takes it home. But notice this. You could say that Achan was literally living in sin. He knew what he had done. He knew he was trying to hide it. He presumed that God wouldn't care. He presumed that he wouldn't get caught. He presumed that it was all going to be okay, all the while living deceitfully. This was something that he was currently living in sin. Again, this was not a slip of the moment. This was something that he was practicing and protecting. He does something. He had no intentions of repenting. You know, I said that that, that's pretty interesting that it says that the silver was underneath. Twice it's mentioned. Once is Achan saying, the gold and the cloak are buried under my tent, and the silver is buried underneath. And when Joshua sends the men to go find it, they go to his tent, they dig a hole, they find the cloak and the gold and the silver underneath. Why in the world would the Bible describe silver underneath? Maybe a better question is why in the world would Achan hide the silver underneath the gold and the cloak? And I don't know. But I surmise that what he was doing was protecting himself. You see, he took the cloak and the gold, 
and buried it on top of the silver. So he buried it in a hole, but below that hole, he buried the silver. So when he dug the hole, he would have dug the silver, put the silver down, covered up the silver, and then in the rest of the hole, he would have put the gold and the cloak. Why would he put the silver underneath the gold and the cloak? I think, I'm speculating, but I think he put it underneath because if somebody was to find that, they're going to find and they're going to pull out the cloak, right? And they're going to pull the gold out of the hole and they're going to walk away thinking they got it all. While in reality, there's silver down lower. He left some up high. Possibly so they wouldn't find the rest that was buried down low. Isn't that a reflection of our heart? Don't we keep all, don't we keep some stuff down lower? We'll speak about sin on the periphery. You ask me how it's going. If I'm in an accountability group, I'll talk to you about sin out here, the, the, the stuff that's buried kind of shallow. But I don't want to talk about the stuff that's buried real deep. I'll let you go down so far. I might even let God go down so far. But you know what? I really don't want to talk about what's buried down deep. I'll let you get some treasure up here. I'll talk about this. I'll use peripheral words. To Aiken's credit, when he's confronted, he says, yeah, there's gold and there's a cloak, but keep digging. When you get to those, no, you haven't hit the bottom yet. Go down below those. Call oh, that you and I I know we're talking about him stealing something. But let me tell you what Achan really did. He took something that was God's and made it his. When we say it like that, it may provide a new dimension on this sin. He didn't just steal. He took something that was God's and made it his. In Malachi chapter 3, God sends the prophet to his people to send some very stern warnings to them. And you know what God says through the prophet Malachi? He says to the people of Israel, how long will you rob God? And they say, of course, how have we robbed God? And God says through the prophet Malachi, through not giving your tithes, what God is saying to them is that that is mine, and you have withheld it. You have held on to it. God actually uses the word rob to describe their disobedience in not being faithful in the tithe. When you go to Acts chapter 14, there was a man, you can look it up this afternoon, there was a man who was being given all kinds of praise, the voice of a God. And it wasn't true, but he didn't correct the people. And you know what? He died. He was robbing God of the glory that was his. When I look at that and see that Achan didn't just steal something, he took something that was God's and made it his, I want to remember that all that I possess is truly God's. My time, my talent, my treasure. And I want to be sure to give to God that which is truly his. Number two, not just the sin, but the cover-up. It went deeper than the surface. He was content to keep it hidden. He had an opportunity to make it right. Don't you know that guy's knees are knocking? I mean, when they go to the tribe of Judah, and he's like, okay, I'm of the tribe of Judah. Okay, they got my grandpa. They're getting close. Now they're shaking down my dad. I would think at this point you would realize you're next on the list, buddy. You should probably start repenting. Even though he tried to cover it up and was living in that sin, had not repented, he learned the lesson of Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. Be sure, God's Word says, that your sin will find you out. His sin found him out. Number three, the consequences. 
what happened here? We want to believe that sin just affects us, and it does affect us, but it affects other people. Look at Adam and Eve. Their sin affected an entire race of people. Every man, woman, or child that has ever been born into the world has fallen under the curse of sin. Thank you, Adam and Eve. Yeah, sin affects others. Think about this. Look what it did to Joshua. It caused Joshua, this faithful leader, to fall on his face and say, God, I don't understand. The sin of Achan caused Joshua to go through a season of dismay, discouragement, depression, whatever you want to call it. He didn't know what was going on. He was confused. Achan's sin had an effect, a real effect on Joshua. Think about the other Israelites. They are, they are riding this wave of victory, and all of a sudden, what's going on? Do you think his sin affected the family of those 36 fallen soldiers in the field of battle? Absolutely. Because he stole, and God withheld his hand of blessing on his people because of that, 36 soldiers died, 36 men died on the field of battle. Yeah, his sin affected other people. And probably the most painful of it all was the effect of Achan's sin on his family. Now, I don't know. I come to this place to say that God is just. And I believe in all of His workings, He is just. And I look at this and I say it was His wife and His kids. An entire generation was wiped out because of Achan's sin and living in sin and not repenting of that sin. God dealt harshly with him. This morning, I want you to think about this for a minute. It's not just about what do I do with the sin that I'm hiding? What do I do with the sin that I've buried? What do I do with the sin that I'm living in? It's not just that. I think there's something else we've got to address. What do I do? What steps do I take to keep that from happening? Right? It's not just about dealing with it after it's happened, but what steps can I take in my life to keep it from happening, to keep me from taking the Babylonian goods back to my house, digging a hole and burying it? What do I have? What should I do? Look at Achan's life. Think about this for a minute. Of all of the thousands of men that went into Jericho, only one of them stole, okay? Only one. Thousands of men breached the rubble of Jericho. Thousands of men would have carried the spoils out, but only one of them stole. You and I want, some, want, want a lesson in what to do? Follow the godly example of others around you. Follow the godly example of others around you. Had he said, you know what, I think I'm going to take this home. I have reason to believe that he would have had a thousand other voices saying, don't do it. There's something about community. There's something about being with other brothers and sisters that are godly influences that are going the right direction. And yes, there's a dearth of godly, it seems godly influence right now. But praise God, there are still godly men and women in this church, I know there are, that are living out an example of how to live, how to walk blameless and God-honoring in your life. Follow the godly example of others. Number two, stay true to God's Word. He knew. He knew what God had said. You go in there, when you find those goods, you don't keep them. You put them in the treasury of the Lord. He knew what he was supposed to do. He sinned against a perfect understanding of right and wrong and presumed he wouldn't get caught and continued to live in that sin unrepentant. And God dealt harshly with him. Stay true to God's Word. Number three, practice contentment. Why did he steal the garments? Because he coveted. He wanted something that wasn't his. Contentment is the enemy of coveting. When I can live in contentment with what I have, grateful for it, I'm not going to lust and yearn for other things. Guys, is this crazy or what? God, Achan, was standing 
at the beginning of some of God's richest blessings on His people. God had already told them, I'm taking you into a land that's going to have gardens you didn't have to plant, that's going to have wells you didn't have to dig, that's going to give you houses you didn't have to build. Here, Achan is standing literally in the place of promise where he was going to get a whole new life, all of these possessions free, and yet he wanted a coat. And yet he wanted gold and silver. He was not content with all that God had given him. You heard me say this quote a while back, John Owen, temptations and occasions put nothing into a man, but only draw out from him what is already there. Achan was caught in this place where he was wanting more, and there is the Babylonian good. So what does he do? Because he already wants it, he yields to that temptation. Follow the godly example of others in your life. Stay true to the Word of God that you know to be true. And number three, practice contentment. Here's the crazy thing. Consider where this happens. Oh, I love this. I want to end with this. Just before the defeat at Ai, what happens? God gives the victory at Jericho, right? Everybody in Jericho died except one family. One family. The family was a prostitute who believed God was who he said he was and asked for mercy to be saved from the destruction and the doom of Jericho. That one family who should have been doomed lived because she asked for mercy. The one family that should have been blessed was destroyed because of egregious, outrageous, unrepented sin. One who was not in the family was brought into the family. One who was in the family was destroyed. God is not a respecter of persons. Now, it is true if you're a child of God, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God for that. But God does love us, and because He loves us, He disciplines us. I'm thankful that God showed mercy and received a repentant Gentile prostitute and left us with this reminder. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, Proverbs 28, 13. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Can I end with this? You want to see how beautiful the gospel is? In the Old Testament, the one who sinned, they took him outside of the camp and they stoned him with stones. 2,000 years ago, the one who didn't sin was taken outside of the camp and was crucified for you and I. The one who didn't do wrong paid for the ones who did do wrong. That's the gospel. The ones who stole received pardon because of the sacrifice, the perfect, complete sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Instead of us dying for our sins, Jesus dies in our place, taking our sins upon Himself, becoming our sacrifice. Friends, are you like Rahab today? You realize you have sinned and that sin has separated you from God, but today you have heard the same God who received a prostitute who begged for mercy was received. And today you know that it doesn't matter what you've done or how many times you've done it. God still stands ready and willing right now to forgive you of your sins and to call you His own through the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here and you're a believer. And maybe there's the gold and the cloak and then down here there's the silver. Would you be real with God this morning? Maybe going to a place that you don't like to go with God. Go all the way to the bottom. If you're living right now and unrepented sin. Would you call out to the Lord? 
Say, God, thank you that you forgive me. Thank you, God, that you restore me. Thank you, God, that you know about this and you still love me. Would you be willing to ask God to help you overcome? Would you use the godly example of others, hold true to the Word of God, and practice contentment so you don't get in that mess again? Would you and I do business with God this morning as His Spirit leads? Salvation, baptism, rededication, church membership, whatever that decision is, I pray that we would make it all to the glory and in obedience of God. Father, I pray this morning that Your Spirit will help us flesh out these truths in our life. Father, thank You for the freedom that we can have in You. Thank You for the long-suffering and the forgiveness that You offer and extend to Your children. Thank You for the promise that it's not just about a place, but You're making a people who love You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.